Granite is some of my favourite rocks. They make up a large part of the Earth's continental crust too, but you can also find them in the human world, used as decorative stones on the front of buildings and even in kitchen counters, in cafes and in your own home. But what actually are granites? How do they form? Where would you find them? Let's dig in and find out. Geology is really cool. Let's go lick some rocks. Hello fellow rock nerds, my name is Brooke and I'm a geologist. Granites are coarse-grained igneous rocks that are rich in silica, aluminium and potassium bearing minerals. Thing is, even though granites are some of the most common crystalline rocks, for a long time they've been a bit of a mystery. Geologists had no idea how they actually formed. We know where basalt and other volcanic rocks come from because we can see them erupt from volcanoes, so geologists reasoned that if we can see basalt erupt from a volcano, so when we find a rock like a gabbro, which has the same chemistry and mineralogy as a basalt, except it's coarse-grained, we know it must have had a similar origin, being derived from partial melting of the mantle. It's just been emplaced at depth, so the crystals have cooled slowly and had a long time to grow. The thing is, we can't quite do that for granite, though, because even though there are things like rhyolites, which are silica-rich volcanic rocks that have a composition very similar to granites, the occurrence of rhyolites doesn't explain the types of chemistries and mineralogies and occurrences that we see in all the different types of granites. And that's because granites form deep underground in places that humans and our instruments can't get to, so we can't watch them as they form as we the same way that we can watch basalt basalt. The same way we can watch basalt being erupted and forming. Another way that granites are different from basaltic rocks is the way that they interact with the host rocks that you find them with. Basaltic rocks tend to erupt and form sheets and walls that we call sills and dikes. Whereas granites form huge underground blobs we call batholiths, and these batholith structures seem to have violently intruded other rocks as though the granite blasted into the host rock coming up from below. But often there's very little of that original host rock remaining. So where does that millions of tons of rock go? It can't just disappear. So we need to explain that while we're also explaining how granites form. Finally, while some granites are found in association with basaltic rocks and in volcanic settings where you'd expect to find igneous rocks. Other granites are found in places that are not associated with any kind of volcanism, like in the core of mountain ranges or in the middle of thick continental crust. So the mysterious origin of granites for a long time was known as the granite problem. And if there's something geologists like, it's a problem to solve, especially one that involves rocks. Some geologists pointed out that the chemistry of granites and rhyolites is very similar, which I already said. The reason that the granites must be the final stage is in a process called fractional crystallisation. And this is the same process that forms basaltic rocks from partial melting of the Earth's mantle. Therefore, they reasoned that granites must be the intrusive equivalent of rhyolites in the same way that gabbro is the intrusive version of a basalt. But that doesn't explain the chemistry of all granites, or the fact that some granites don't occur associated with rhyolites or volcanic rocks at all. Other geologists found granites with chemistry almost identical to sedimentary rocks, like mudstones. These granites were often found intruding into sedimentary rocks and contained deformed and cooked chunks of the host rock inside them. These geologists argued that granites must form via the alteration of pre-existing sedimentary rocks, either by melting, a process called anatexis, or by alteration of existing sedimentary rocks by mineral-rich fluids. That's a process called metasomatism. It doesn't explain the granites that have chemistry like rhyolites. It doesn't explain this third type of granite, the weird ones. Finally, there's a set of granites that, with unusual chemistry, like lots of rare earth elements, that occurred in the middle of continents, a long way from any volcanic activity or mountain building type events. Some geologists propose that these granites were formed deep under the continent when already metamorphosed rocks has been melted by unusually hot areas of the mantle that we call hotspots. Again though, this doesn't explain all granites. So, where are granites coming from? Well, what you've probably figured out on your own by now is that all of these explanations are true. There are different kinds of granites that form in different tectonic settings, that's like places within the earth where active geology is happening. And the research that I've just been talking about became the basis for the modern granite classification system, also known as the alphabet system. The alphabet system has three main types of granites, and that covers most of the granites that, were, that you'll see out in the wild and, and as building stones and countertops. First type of granites are our M-type granites, and the M stands for mantle because these granites were originally derived from the mantle via fractional distillation, fractional crystallization. 
and they represent the final silica-rich contents of a magma reservoir where all the silica-poor material has already crystallised and been erupted as basalt or intruded as gabbros and then other volcanic products. You can see my gabbro episode for more in information about how that works. An example of an M-type granite would be the Arran granite on the Isle of Arran in Scotland. So 50 million odd years ago, 55 million years ago, who's counting, the North Atlantic started to open and the continent of Eurasia rifted apart. And we had the eruption of lots of basaltic material because that rifting depressurized the mantle, caused melting and produced a basaltic melt. But after all of that basalt and gabbro and the other types of volcanic products had been erupted, right at the end we had all of this silica-rich material left. And that blobbed up in various places like Arran and Sky, and we ended up with these large batholiths of M-type granite. S-type and I-type granites are produced by melting of pre-existing igneous rocks for I-type and sedimentary rocks for S-type. This usually occurs during the final stages of ocean closure and mountain building. Subduction zones carry a lot of water down into the crust in amongst all of that mud and oceanic, oceanic crust rock. And this lowers the melting point of rocks, allowing granitic magmas to form. Because they're warm and less dense than the surrounding material, they kind of blob up into the edges and the middle of mountain chains. So a good example of this are the Caledonian granites in Scotland. And these are classic S-type granites. And some of the Jurassic granites in the Sierra Stero, some of the Jurassic granites in the Sierra Nevada in the USA are really nice I-type granites as well. And the final type of granite we're going to talk about is an A-type granite, which means anorogenic. They're not involved with, they're not formed from mountain building. These type of granites form when a mantle plume, which is basically like a big jet of heat in the mantle, heats up the underside of thick continental crust that we call craton and that causes melting of rocks that have already been heavily metamorphosed so what we call granulite rocks and the melting of these rocks produces these air type granites one of the places on modern earth where you can find this happening is yellowstone park and so you get generation of air type granites and rhyolites there this process can also lead to continental rifting so air type granites can often be found in early rift settings as well. Granite intrusions, especially S-type granites, can produce all kinds of exotic minerals. But for a rock to be classed as a granite, it needs to contain at least 20 to 60% quartz. And the feldspars need to be composed of 35 to 90% alkali feldspar. So what does that mean if you're looking at a chunk of granite in a nice building or countertop? In this example, we can see that we've got lots of these greasy gray blobs, and that's the quartz. The reason quartz forms these little blobs rather than nice crystals is because the quartz is crystallizing last, so it's having to fill in any space that's being left over by the other minerals. Next, we've got these long tabular pink crystals that look a bit like wonky dominoes. Some of them, have, you can see, have little zones in them. And this is our alkali feldspars. This is our orthoclase. And the pink color comes from all of the potassium it contains. We can also see there's a few of these little white, pinky white crystals. These are plagioclase feldspars, and these are the ones that contain calcium and sodium. So the quartz and the, the feldspars are the essential minerals which allow us to classify the rock, but they're not the only minerals that you're going to find in a granite. Some other common minerals you're going to find in a granite are these little black needles, and they're called hornblend. And hornblends are a type of group of minerals called amphiboles. While these little black plates that we can see are a type of mica called biotite, and that's a type of clay. These silver plates as well are another type of clay, and that's a, a mica mineral called muscovite. So the fact that we've got two types of clay in there, two types of mica, means that we've got a lot of potassium and a lot of aluminium, and that's a characteristic of an S-type granite that was produced by the melting of sedimentary rocks. And that's exactly what this is. This is a piece of Shap granite from the Lake District in northwest UK. And this was intruded into, the, in, into its host rocks in the Devonian during the final assembly of the continent of Laurusia when the paleocontinent Avalone collided with North America. And that's how the Brit part of how the British Isles formed. To find granites in the wild, the best places to look are mountains, especially older mountain ranges like the Scottish Highlands that have had enough time to for all of the surface rocks to be eroded away so you can get down to the granitic core where all the melting was going on. There are some wonderful examples in northwest Scotland where you can actually see the process of metamorphic rocks undergoing melting and these kind of rocks are called migmatites and they look really cool. They're all blobby and melty. 
If you can't get to mountains, then look at the buildings in your town or city. Official buildings and old buildings like banks and even shops can have granite facing and floor tiles. Kitchen countertops and kitchen countertops in coffee shops are also another good place to look for granites. So if in doubt when you're looking at a building and you want to try and figure out if it's a granite, if the rock is coarse grained, if it's big enough for you to see the crystals quite easily, and there's lots of white to and pink tabular crystals and lots of greasy grey crystal blobs, then that's probably a granite. Not all granites are going to have the pink crystals in though, so watch out for that. Some granites are just white. Well, that's all for today. I've blasted you with a load of granitic knowledge. I'll probably do in-depth videos where I look at all of the other different types of granites in detail in future episodes, but for now, get outside, have a look with some granites on your own. If you find any cool ones, let me know in the comments below and make sure to leave a, a like and a subscribe. And let me know if there's any types of geology or rock that you want me to make a video about in the future. Make sure you subscribe as well so you don't miss out on future videos because I'm going to be starting doing them regularly again. So until next time, take care, have fun, see you later. Bye bye rock nerds. Such a dweeb. Boop.